The morning of September 11th, I had a two hour class, so I didn't even know about it till like 11.30. Like nobody told me, we were all in class, oblivious. I came home, all my roommates are sitting around the TV watching CNN. Like, I'm like, what are you guys doing home? Because usually they have class and they're all with panic looked in their face. The World Trade Center got hit. The World Trade Center, two airplanes flew into it. And I didn't believe them because what, what are the chances that's going to happen? But then I saw it for myself and it was like, what the hell? What the hell is this? I mean, who has the balls to fly two planes into the America and blow stuff up? You know, so at first, you know, I was panicked. Like, the Pentagon gets hit too. Another plane crashes out in Pennsylvania. And then I got angry, you know, and like some of my friends who I never thought would say anything racist, you know, things started flying out of their mouths. It was just crazy. And then I went upstairs and I called some of my friends whose parents work at the World Trade Center. I live in New Jersey, so most of my town works in New York, a lot of them in the World Trade Center. Uh, both of them didn't know where their parents were. My one friend, he was really worried. His mom was on the phone with them constantly. like. His dad couldn't call him because his cell phone was like broken or something and he couldn't get out of New York so that was pretty scary. Another one of my friends, her dad had a dentist appointment that morning so he had come in late. He was in the lobby when, the, when his tower got hit and he worked on the floor that um, the plane actually flew into so he would have been dead. So it was pretty hairy there. Uh, yeah, my town was right in the middle of it. I even had the Anthrax airport, or not airport, uh, post office that that letter got sent out of. So um, my mom teaches fifth grade at the school. All, ki all kinds of kids were getting pulled out of her classroom because their parents were missing, possibly dead. One of the kids that um, my mom teaches was her dad was one of the pilots that um, was in the plane that blew up. So, you know, things were pretty hectic there for a while. A lot of counseling. Um, other than that, there were a lot of church services every day in my town. And every, the church was packed. My parents said they'd never seen it that packed. It was just... But, um, yeah, so a lot of people in my town a lot of people died. And then like you see commercials on TV, car companies trying to um, you know, sell off of it. Like if you don't buy my Saturn, um, the terrorists are going to win. I thought that was kind of tacky. People cashing in on lots of people dying. And then the other day on... Uh, there was a time in my life when I think I would have done anything to protect and serve this country. But now I'm a firm believer in peace under any circumstances. September 11th didn't give me a fear for the future. Rather, it made me look back at my life and find a new value for what I've become and who I've become. When I first saw the terrorist attacks, I was in a classroom, a film class as a matter of fact. And about 10 minutes before the class ended, the film technician put on the news after seeing a clip. We put on the news, there wasn't any sound to the news, so there we, we sat there in awe. Um, it was the most eerie silence I've ever experienced. And I remember seeing some students reach for their cell phones but didn't make a call. And I believe it was perhaps because the scenes that we saw, I don't think we could negotiate them with reality. Um, one of the most powerful scenes that I remember is that of the dust, glass, and debris, and um, papers falling from the sky. I couldn't help but to think about how those papers were related to all those people who died. In some sense, they were resumes, bills, memos, checks that had their names on them, and they were related to those people. I just couldn't imagine how such a destruction could separate those people from those documents. So what I did is I went home, and I found all these papers on my floor. I immediately tried to clean them all up, uh, store them away neatly, uh, file them away, and that's when I realized that I wanted to spend some time looking through those files. and and you know, finding out a little bit about the things, the papers that I've been storing away for so long. Um, and when I did that, I realized that there was a letter in those files. Uh, the letter was from United States Military Academy, West Point. And interestingly enough, I looked at that letter 
and I was excited. It's something that was very important to me when I was at that age, right out of high school, and I had worked hard for that. Um, unfortunately, about two months before I left for West Point, New York, um, I got a letter from Dodmer, the Department of Defense Medical Review Board, uh, saying, I'm sorry, but you've been disqualified because of your eyesight. Apparently, the de my depth perception, my eyesight, was .00 something off the requirements, so I didn't get to go, and they repealed my admissions. What I'm saying is that I think it's amazing how such an event like September 11th can make me look back at a specific point and moment in my life where I became a different person. Um, I can't help but ask myself, if I had gone to West Point and if I had graduated, I would have been an officer. And I'd be asking myself, what would I be doing? I'm asking myself, what would I be doing in that position? Who would I be? I just think that, that person um, who would have gone to West Point and the person that I am now, it's just two completely different people. And September 11th really made me think about that. Is it ready? Yep. Right. September 11th uh, of 2001, I was actually in India uh, studying abroad on a program. Uh, I was in the southern city of Mysore, and it was about 7 or 8 o'clock in the afternoon of September uh, with the time change that I became aware of the incident in New York. Uh, my first impression was kind of a confusion, uh, but as other students became run running around, uh, I started to become aware uh, of the Twin Towers. One student came to me and said that uh, a plane hit the White House, uh, and I became very... Um, kind of scared at the time. I, uh, fortunately for the students, we had TV so I could watch CNN and get the news straight from the TV. I uh, watched as the planes flew into the towers and I, I recall everybody being completely silent at the time. As time went on, uh, I, I recall just watching TV over and over again to get all the news update, up to date. Uh, my parents became very nervous since I was in India because uh, I became aware that the U.S. was making uh, a lot of news about uh, Islam uh, and how it was involved with the, the airplane. Um, India has a, a, a large population of uh, Muslim people mixed in with Hindus, so obviously my parents were very worried. However, at the time, that wasn't uh, too much of a worry because people there are very, very, uh, really nice to the foreigners. Uh, but because they worried so much, I was forced to, to go home. Uh, but it was kind of odd because the airline I was flying back was Kuwaiti Airlines, which was uh, predominantly an um, uh, is Islamic uh, airline through Kuwait. And I had to spend a day in Kuwait on the way, on the way back home. Um, it was actually an interesting experience for me because uh, I wasn't scared or anything, but it made me more of aware of the people, uh, and I, 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 I tried to think of how they felt about the situation. Uh, in Kuwait, you know, I got the other side of the story. It's a lot different than what we think of it in the U.S. Uh, people were either, you know, angry for the stance that we had, or uh, they felt much sympathy toward me. Uh, I started to recall about my, my travels before I went to India and all the countries I've been through. I was in countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, which were predominantly uh, Muslim countries. I thought back and I always recalled the people being extremely friendly and you know, religion was never a factor in our, our friendships. Uh, when I came back going through uh, Chicago, uh, the customs officers always, uh, they were very nice to me. They let me go through, but all the other people on the plane, they gave them a hard time. It was a typical Tuesday of last semester. I didn't have any classes that day, and the class I normally teach, a composition course, wasn't meeting. But I still had to get up early at around 7 or so because I work in addition to teaching at a, a library, just a typical library job, the same sort of thing I had in high school. The only interesting thing about my job is that I work at the medical library, and within the medical library I work exclusively in the rare book room. And what's interesting about that is that I work with books that can be about 500 years old or so, old manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, as well as more recent books from the uh, 18th century, 19th century. Some of these books are very, very valuable and very important historically. We have a first edition of William Harvey's work on the human circulatory system. He was the first person 
figure out how blood travels through the body. We have several first editions of Vesalius' anatomy, and he was an important early anatomist. And this stuff is really interesting, but what really interests me about my job is what I sometimes discover within the book, which are names of people who are really just sort of forgotten to history in ways, former owners. Sometimes I find a postcard or a letter, just little personal things that people have forgotten. It's interesting too sometimes because you become aware of the history of the books. The binding will fall apart and you'll find an old scrap of newspaper detailing the storming of the Bastille only a month after it happened. And on that particular Tuesday when I was just going about my business, I came across this old pharmacist's log and on the back inside cover he had noted that this was the day that uh, the Confederate forces surrendered at Appomattox. Here he had witnessed this what he thought would be an important moment in history, and he decided to note it there. And I thought that was really interesting that I could be so far removed in time, and that I could see that, and it was important that he had noted it. So here I was in the library, just going about my job, when suddenly my boss comes to me, and she explains what had happened with the planes, and there was a lot of confusion. She wasn't really sure how many had crashed, and the extent of the damage, and I was nowhere near a radio or a television, so I, I really didn't believe what was going on at first. But I sat there with, with all those old books that are all dedicated essentially to uh, the preservation of human life. And it was hard to consider that so many had been lost. And I remember that day leaving it and thinking, God, I, you know, this is a moment in history, right, that I've just experienced and lived through. And I'd really hoped that it could have just been a uh, Tuesday. September 11th is a day that I'll always remember. Um, I remember uh, waking up that morning and my roommate came flying in saying, you know, turn the TV on. And I turned it on. The chill that I got when I saw those two planes heading into the uh, World Trade Center was, it was you couldn't you couldn't describe you couldn't describe that chill that went down my my spinal cord. And, um, I called home and talked to my friends and my parents, and uh, and they let me know about the bad news. And uh, my good my good friend, my hockey coach, who uh, you know helped me uh, to get where I am today. Um, he got on that uh, plane headed for Los Angeles that morning as standby. He wasn't he wasn't originally scheduled for it, but he he uh, ended up getting on that plane, and you know, and then um, I heard about what happened and. Uh, you know, it really hit home knowing that he was on that plane and what those terrorists did. Um, it was unbelievable, and uh, you know he'll always be rem remembered. His name was Mark Davis, uh, and basically, um, I went to the funeral, and uh, he had a twin brother, and it was one of the hardest things you possibly could imagine losing your twin brother in the uh, most remembered event that has ever happened. Um, it was just amazing to see the group of people, the way Americans came together on that one special event. Um, and uh, I saw it at that funeral that day. I mean, people just came from all over, feeling the family's pain and sorrow. And uh, you know, from then on, I've uh, supported President Bush and become such a such a true American to the uh, country. And uh, you know, that's why I'll support President Bush for as long as he stops terrorism and, you know, keep us safe and never let that happen again. Um, and as I grow up, I'll be telling my grandkids, you know, they'll be telling their grandkids about September 11th. And that's why I chose this song by Alan Jackson because I'm always going to remember where I was that day when I heard the news. I was out here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, it was just amazing that I lived, I was safe and I lived through that and um, you know I will go on living my life but September 11th was something that everyone should uh, you know take time out of their life and just be thankful that you're still here and uh, you know President Bush is going to do his best to stop terrorism and um, I think we'll be we're all going to strive and become excellent and uh, just uh, you know we're all going to come together as one America will be great and just live on and nothing more like that will happen again. 
I remember on September 11th, uh, I was going from my one class to the other. It was my first class in astronomy, and I was very nervous to get to my next class. So I was going through Angel Hall, and I was going, 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 and all these people were standing around and looking at the, at the TV they had set up there. And I looked, and I said, planes crashed into the World Trade Center. I didn't understand, you know, the enormity of the situation. And I said, okay, I see Washington up there. It's not Washington where my family lives, so I can go on. And so I did. And later, of course, they canceled classes, and I met up with my other friends, and we just went to their apartment and sat and watched TV and sat and sat and sat. And that's all I remember the day, just watching the TV and about not getting up for about eight hours straight. I remember that someone called in a bomb threat to the uh, building where my boyfriend works, just the LSNA building. And I was pretty upset that someone called in a bomb threat because, you know, that was my boyfriend. And... It's kind of sobering to think, you know, if my boyfriend worked there, then that would be enough. That, that would be all. I remember reading the New York Times and reading all the obituaries that they wrote and trying to imagine, you know, each one being someone that I loved. Reading about the plans to attack the Space Needle, because, of, of course, I said my family lives in Washington. It was very upsetting. And I remember, of course, I was also upset because I'm, I was read about the Afghanistan woman and, you know, having to wear the burqa and not being able to, you know, be schooled or anything like that. And so I was worried, you know, how can I possibly really support them being bombed when before I've been worried about how, you know, they're going to live. I don't know. I remember that uh, my dad wasn't in the World Trade Center. He wasn't even in New York, but he had some coworkers that were there. My mom was telling me about how they were they were in the hotel, and one of them heard the plane go in the building, and uh, so he ran back up to his hotel room to get his stuff. He was kind of silly about that, and he heard the other plane go, and he was knocked all across the hotel room just by the force of the impact of the plane. I remember thinking, what if that was my dad? Well, what if that was my boyfriend? <laughs> I was worried about my boyfriend be drafted. I mean, he's deaf, he has flat feet, he's not very likely, but I guess that's just how I was worried that it would touch me and be something important in my life, but I don't know. Do I start talking now? Go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, as you can tell from my shirt and uh, my song choice. I am a New Yorker, and um, as a result of that, I have a different, I guess, opinion than many people you'll speak to from, uh, you know, who are Michigan residents and lived here all their lives. Um, New York is still, it's, it's still an important issue. I know it's after six months after the September 11 attacks, but it's this New York atmosphere is, is so much different than it was before, and not only, I mean, yes, the World Trade Center is gone, and there's so many lost lives. And even though I personally don't know anybody, I have friends that do, um, you know, six degrees, you know, six degrees of separation, like it's not too far in either direction if you're a Michigan, if you're a Michigan resident and lived here all your life and whatnot. Um, it's just, it's so, it's, it's so hard for me when people just, you know, think they just don't, they don't care about it anymore. I like guess lost interest and, you know, people don't care about it anymore because it's like well you know kind of like get over it and if you've been to New York since then it is a totally different atmosphere I remember going I've been to Kennedy Airport where one of the terrorist planes where one of the terrorists hijacked the plane and there's guys big guys with machine guns I mean in Metro Airport is they have guns but I mean these are big um, AK-47s or whatnot whatever the guns are called and um, but that's something issue and also I want to talk about is Though New York is, is though de deeply still deeply affects me, uh, scapegoating of, my, of you know middle of uh, minorities of Middle Eastern descent angers me so much. I mean, the, you know the Taliban or whoever community attacks. That's it's just they get like it's just I mean I don't obviously don't support that, but I mean just to, to stereotype all you know to. 
do racial profiling of you know, mil of Middle Easterners and all that is wrong. And uh, and it's, it's just hard for me because people support that because they're like, well, you know, they. It's I I just hard for me to accept that and it's, it's something that people like were okay with like when they had all the questioning of a U of M people from the U of M students and you know, no one really it wasn't I don't know people weren't really didn't really protest that as they should have I mean people did a small you know extreme group of people and that needs to be remembered and uh, I mean, I mean that small group affected my hometown, and so I'm not obviously not supportive of them. I'm a less supporter of trying to, you know, of this racial profiling. Um, what else? I guess. Oh. Uh, I used to look at American flags and definitely get a sense of patriotism, but in the last few months, uh, I can't help every time I see one getting kind of a feeling of disgust in my stomach. And thinking about it as much as I have, I guess I'm kind of confused why I can't fully wrap my mind around what I'm feeling and why I have so much anger. Um, on September 11th, I was in class when my teacher came in and he was just blown away, stunned. It was about 9 a.m. And, and he said, I'm sorry I'm late, but I just saw the most amazing thing. A plane crashed into the World Trade Center. And I thought it was an accident, and after going to my next few classes, you know, we, we realized what was going on. And at first I felt the horror that everyone seemed to feel, and I really understood where people were coming from. But very quickly after that, my feelings were replaced by anger. Um, but not at the evil ones that President Bush loves to talk about. Um, first it was anger about the racism going on, and I was very frustrated that immediately people started being stupid, and um, that was really difficult. Um, but then it changed, and my next anger was at the media for the sensationalism, anger at Bush for the way he was treating it, and all of a sudden I got very angry at patriotism in general, and everyone's saying that now they understand what it's like to be other nations, and now we're part of this big club, and I don't think that when you break a fingernail, you suddenly understand what it's like to be disabled. I, I've been infuriated by this for some time, and I'm not sure why. I understand what it's like to lose someone that you love. And I understand, I, I can't help it, when I watch the New York City concert that they had, every time a little girl got on the stage with a picture of her dad, I would start to bawl. And for that reason, I understand those people's fights. I understand their need to be part of this, but I, I can't help my feeling that the rest of the country seems to be crashing the funeral for the buffet, and I know that's not fair, and I know that people need something to belong to, but I don't understand it. And September 11th is not my day, and I don't think it's most people's day. February 8th is my day, and that's the day for me that will change things, that will make me look at things differently. And since February 8th, I think it's made it a little bit easier for me to understand why so many people have reacted the way that they do. But I just want the anger to go away. I am an Army cadet. Soon I will take an oath and become an Army officer committed to defending the values which make this nation great. Honor is my touchstone. I understand duty first and people always. I am the past, the spirit of those warriors who have made the final sacrifice. I am the present, the scholar and apprentice soldier, enhancing my skills in the science of warfare and in the art of leadership. But above all, I'm the future, the future warrior leader of the United States Army May God give me the compassion and judgment to lead and the gallantry in battle to win. I will do my duty. Yet there was a silent sigh on the streets of New York, scanned by cameras, transmitted through televisions and into our hearts. Reflection before the morning of September 11th. When was the last time 
that you said, mother or father, I love you. Reflection before the morning of September 11th. When was the last time you heard them say, daughter or son, I love you? The ones who we claim to cherish, and yet unexpected tragedy occurs. And then love that we often take advantage of is left unexpressed. The first thing I did as soon as I saw CNN, and I'm usually an unexpressive, unemotional person, was tell my parents that I love them. Yet there was still drama. I have to do my duty as a military person. And my parents, they want me to quit. All I have to say is, I see when people cry and I see the pain that they feel and I'm willing to make that sacrifice in order to give them closure. And it's weird how stuff changes. Before September 11th, people used to ask, why did you join the army? And now people ask, how can I join the army? It's not about being a hero. It's about giving people peace of mind. And September 11th has given me the opportunity to, to put a smile on people's faces. And when tragedy occurs, this is when we all come together and we need to be as one. Love for all and all for one. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> I woke up on September 11th to the sound of my roommate crying. She was, she was sobbing. It was, it was like laughter almost. I, it's hard to describe. A minute later, she burst into my room. The first tower had fallen. I'm not sure why she waited until then to tell me about the tower falling, or about, about the disaster, about the Pentagon, the two planes, the second of which she saw live on television. I came out and hugged her, and she sobbed. And I couldn't believe there was only one building standing. How would this change things? I, I watched the one building. She left the room, and it fell. And I had to tell her that the second building had fallen. I, t I, I thought about my dad a lot because he was, he's an architect. He tells me that he saw both of the buildings fall and the second plane hit on a large screen television in a conference room at his office. It's an, sort of like film becoming life. You know, everyone compared it to film and he saw it like one would see a film. The, these stories I tell see, come from telling them over and over again to my family, to my friends, to people that I just meet and start talking about September 11th. Everyone talks about it now. And these stories have been practiced and parts of these stories are left out. I talked to my mom yesterday about what I had spoken to her about on the date because I wanted to see how my stories had changed. She remembered that I talked more about the racism involved, the immediate racism um, where people were immediately thinking it was a Middle Easterner, a, a terrorist, obviously. N nobody thought that maybe it was someone like Timothy McVeigh. And I'm not sure why that's left out now, left out of my stories now. Things have changed with my family since September 11th. My mom and dad, I talk to them more now. And I feel like I'm closer to them. I tell them I love them. I feel like I've learned what things are important in life. Um, this photograph is from the trip that we took together to New York back when, you know, I hated my parents, but now I look at it and remember that I love my parents very much. My parents met in Afghanistan, so they were Peace Corps volunteers, and I think that that is what makes some of the events of September 11th very different to me, because this is a, now, now we are in a war with Afghanistan. Um, I, my, my parents, um, oh no, <laughs> this one, I, I talked a lot faster this time. I love my parents very much.
Okay, um, 9 September 11th, um, the morning of, I was laying on the couch, the alarm went off, um, I hit it about a million times, and I was thinking, as I do practically every morning, I, want, I hate school, I don't want to go right now, I wish it was still summer, um, but I got up and um, I turned on the TV to check the weather. And um, on every channel there was something about the Twin Towers and um, the plane crashes and all that. And um, I was pretty shocked at first because I have a lot of family that live in New York City. And um, so I called my parents and um, they didn't know anything yet. So I ended up going to class. and. Um, you know, it was a big buzz and everybody was talking about it. And then um, classes were canceled that afternoon and I went home and I sat down and I watched the news all day long. And um, finally I heard back from my family and um, they were okay and everything. And so, you know, I was relieved. And for about a week I, I you know, paid close attention to everything that was going on just to, um, you know, get an update. But after that, I sort of lost interest in it. I kind of had, um, I don't know, terror overload or something. And I wasn't, you know, it was just, I didn't want to really um, watch that kind of stuff anymore. Um, but now, um, you know, before a lot of people were saying how they were um, scared and, you know, felt unsafe and I never really felt that way like I don't know if that's weird or whatever but I never really felt unsafe or scared or anything like that and um, so uh, I just I don't know I I just think that um, I don't know this it's been about what about six months now and um it seems like, you know, nothing's really happened to find these, find Osama bin Laden or whatever, and, um, I mean, I, I really don't, I mean, I do think about it once in a while, but it's not really on the top priority list anymore, and, um, actually I was there for spring break, and I saw the big hole where the, where the towers fell, and it was kind of nerve-wracking just a little bit, but, um, you know. Are we becoming more comfortable with nuclear weapons? According to the Washington Post, a week ago Saturday, the Los Angeles Times reported on its front page that the Bush administration has directed the military to prepare contingen contingency plans to use nuclear weapons against at least seven countries and to build smaller nuclear weapons for use in certain battlefield situations, according to the classified Pentagon report. Studies were completed in December that modified nuclear weapons to attack underground bunkers and tunnels that conventional weapons can't destroy. Studies were also done to quench the need for new low-yield nuclear weapons against threatening nations such as China, Iraq, Iran, Libya, North Korea, Russia, and Syria. When President Bush was asked why attack countries such as Libya and Syria, he responded by saying, we've got all options on the table because we want to make it very clear to nations that you will not threaten the United States or use weapons of mass destruction against us or our allies or friends. The terrorist attacks on September 11th have spawned the war on terror and Bush believes that history has called us to action and that it is necessary to seize the moment for the good of the world, for peace in the world, and for freedom. I remember sitting at work on September 11th when I heard on the radio that the World Trade Centers were bombed and I wondered how far um, these, these attacks would go and what the U.S. would do in retaliation. And I believe that peace in one part of the world doesn't necessarily guarantee peace in another. It's necessary to remember the history and the absolute horrors that occurred during the bombing, bombings of World War II when discussing the new generation of nuclear weapons. For more than a decade, the United States has sought to deter threatening states from using weapons of mass destru destruction by publicly suggesting that it might respond with a nuclear strike. And the Pentagon has backed the threat by laying out theoretical targets on Iran, Iraq, and other possible threatening nations. The continued and more public discussion about nuclear warfare leads many people to fear that nuclear weapons are no longer the weapon of last resort, but weapons of first choice. 
Elevating the use of nuclear weapons to a standard battlefield weapon is moving the world to a new standard, and the use of nuclear warfare on smaller targets may lower the threshold for launching nuclear weapons in the future. Bush states that the need for us to be involved in the Middle East is to help save lives, and that this war is more akin to World War II than it is to Vietnam. This is a war in which we fight for liberties and freedom. But what does this say about our nation? Does this prove that it is successful in hiding the atrocities of World War II bombings? Was it successful in sweeping history under the rug? Has the United States successfully justified the need for nuclear weapons in order to maintain peace and order? When I woke up on the morning of September 11th, I had no idea how much the world had changed around me overnight. I woke up in the morning, it was about 10, to find both the towers on fire, both two planes had slammed into them. I just woke up, turned on the TV, and it was right there in front of me. I didn't really know what to think of it at the time. I don't know really what to think of it now even. But the problem was is that it just didn't seem like it was going to end. Then the towers collapsed, the plane crashed in Pennsylvania, and someone crashed another plane into the Pentagon. I didn't even know what to think of at the time, like I said, so I just went ahead and it was the first week of classes, so I thought it would be a good idea if I just tried to go to class. So I went downstairs in my apartment building where I found a girl on her cell phone begging, if not pleading, to find out whether or not her father was still alive. And I really didn't, that's when it hit me that this was real and that this wasn't some kind of movie set, that we were all a part of this now and it was our, the world had changed forever. From there, I just decided that class didn't matter that day. And I didn't know if it was going to matter the next day or the day after that because I didn't know when this was going to end. Planes just kept on crashing, people just kept on dying. And I didn't know what to think about it, I didn't know what to do. So I went back upstairs after seeing the girl on her cell phone. And I just, we just, my, my three roommates and I decided that we had to go and do something. It didn't matter what, we had to feel like we were doing something useful. So we went ahead and went to the Red Cross to try and donate blood. And that's when I actually got my first sense of hope that everything was going to be OK. We went to the Red Cross, and we found out that there was too many people there already. They actually had to turn us back. There was no point in us being there because so many others had already stepped in before us. All we could do is sign a sheet and say that we'd be there the next day, which we were. But. For that brief moment, we knew that we were going to be all right, that so many people were going to pitch in and that this whole thing that happened was eventually just going to fade into memory. But the strong will of the people at the time could, just couldn't be overshadowed, that we weren't just going to take this sitting down and that we were going to go on no matter what. When I look back on it, it seems so long ago, even though it was only six months, I don't know if that seems like a long time or a short time, I guess, now that I say it was a long time ago, but I do know that I think we're going to be all right. I think that the fear and the hopelessness that was felt that morning will fade into nothingness and hopefully just fade into memory where we will know where we were and where we've come from, but we'll also know who we are and the events of September 11th will never be forgotten. I was born on the 39th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor bombing. Um, I've always had a, a greater interest in, in this historical event than most of my peers, but um, I never really understood what it meant to, to be a part of something that would become history. Um, the, the attacks in New York and the Pentagon on September 11th, um, Really changed my life forever. Um, I I know multiple facts and figures and names from from December seventh, nineteen forty one, but that's all I know. All I know is facts and figures and names. <clears throat> I don't know what's what's going to come of of the war in the Middle East and if we'll ever find out what really went on. But I I don't know how I'm going to react 40 years down the road when I see in a book 
the account of what happened on that day. Um, where, where does reality become fact, and where does emotion become numbers and facts and figures? I don't know. Um, but nothing I will ever see in a book can truly sum up how I felt on that day. The first five minutes, the first hour, the first two days following the attacks. I don't know what can. I don't know what can convey to other people what I felt. I don't know if anything ever will be able to, but I hope that for future generations to understand what happened, we can find a way and that they don't have to witness a catastrophe like this on their own to finally understand what history really is. I know that's what it took for me, and I hope that we can find some way to learn about ourselves, to learn about our predecessors, to learn about human nature, to, to figure out what happened that day and avoid events like this in the future.